Greetings again. This is the International Council for Small Business, and this is the ICSB Exchange webinar. Today is Monday, April 13. I want to welcome you all, and especially I want to welcome Dr. Alex DeNoble. Greetings, Alex. How are you? Thank you, Ayman. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today and uh, to be speaking about uh, uh, the topics we plan to talk about, but I'm doing fine. I hope you are too. Wonderful. And I want to say uh, welcome to everybody from around the world. This uh, session is recorded for our ICSB family members worldwide. So let's start, Alex. I'm going to move the slide to the next one. <clears throat> so let me introduce Alex a little bit. I will officially introduce Alex and then we'll go from there. Dr. Alex DeNoble is a director of the Lavin Entrepreneurship Center and professor. He is a professor in the management department in the Fowler College of Business at San Diego State University. He is also the executive director of SDSU's Lavin Entrepreneurship Center. His primary areas of expertise include entrepreneurship and corporate innovation, technology commercialization, and strategic management. Alex, why don't you add a little bit more on this? What more can I add? Um, <laughs> Um, now, I am very fascinated and, uh, with um, uh, how young entrepreneurs or how entrepreneurs learn. It doesn't matter what age, but um, um, how entrepreneurs acquire their skill sets and competencies to, to execute on, um, on bringing their ideas to the marketplace. So we do a lot of studies around uh, those kinds of issues. Great. Let me um, get to the point here. The, the, let me explain to you the format of this uh, ICSB exchange webinar, and then we'll get into the first question here. So the idea of this exchange webinar is basically we're innovating a little bit how ICSB has done their webinars in the past. Usually in the past, we invite a guest speaker. We ask him to present some, pre prepare some slides for us on specific topics, and they usually generate 20 or 30 slides and they come and they give us about 30 to 40 minutes of a presentation on a specific topic. And that worked wonderfully where uh, the webinars have been, uh, have been watched in over 70 countries worldwide and we get a lot of interest more and more on these webinars. But today's webinar is a little bit different. This is actually the first time we do such a webinar and I'm very excited. This is a one-on-one -on -one uncensored, unplanned, presentation style webinar and I've sent you the slides about 20 minutes ago I said to you here's the questions that I'm going to be asking the audience will be asking some questions later on and we're going to have a back and forth uncensored unfiltered uh, conversation about the topic which is about you know reimagining entrepreneurship pedagogy uh, and research and teaching and everything dealing with entrepreneurship so that's the format. You are our first host on this uncensored one-on-one -on -one conversation with ICSP Exchange webinar. So you're, you're on the hot seat, if I may. <laughs> so, uh, so would you like to say something before we start? Because I'm gonna come with difficult questions. Well, this is gonna be uncensored, huh? So um, he did send me uh, uh, just a quick heads up on the questions about uh, 15, 20 minutes ago, so this purely will be uncensored, but Ayman um, um, and I have been longtime friends. Um, uh, I'm very excited what we're doing um, uh, together, uh, not only with this conference coming up, but um, uh, in building a global network of um, uh, entrepreneurship educators, researchers, practitioners, um, uh, so this is going to be a fun session going back and forth, but um, it will be uncensored. So let's get to it, Ayman. Fair enough. I am excited. So the, the question speaks for itself on the screen here. How can teaching entrepreneurship and innovation be developed at universities? It's a broad question, but I'm taking notes here and I'm going to come with clarifications. And at this point, what I'd like to do as well is everybody in the Q&A section, if you may, Write some of those um, questions as well, if you can. And, or in the chat section. Let's do the chat section better so I can follow you. So please write some of your questions in the chat section so I can follow. All right, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ayman. Well, as you know, um, uh, 
uh, entrepreneurship is um, uh, is a very very broad topic, and it's and it's approached uh, it's a, a approached in so many different ways. But um, uh, how can teaching entrepreneurship and innovation be developed at universities? Um, uh, I think it starts with engagement. Uh, it starts with um, you know, I, I, like, I like to refer to um, the entrepreneurship as a contact sport, if you will. Um, we think it's important that our students understand the language of entrepreneurship, um, um, some of the important tools, concepts, uh, theories that underlie our thinking. Uh, but it really is also application oriented um, um, and it's 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 about developing not only an entrepreneurial mindset but developing skills and competencies to um, execute so it requires at a university not only a strong um, um, uh, academic program that that covers a lot of content but I think programs at universities have to have a strong co-curricular set of activities that include internships with startup entrepreneurs or early stage companies that include mentorships that include uh, opportunities for our students to to build competencies and to build the kind of skill sets that they're going to need to execute on uh, once they leave the university. Alex, fair enough. I think that was the answer that everybody expected. But mm -hmm. this is uncensored now. So here, here I, I come, and this is, this is not coming from me. But let's be real here. We, we have these students coming in our classes that are young and they say, oh, I want to start a business or I want to mm -hmm. start this and I want to start this. And in reality, they, have even, they, ha they haven't even worked for a real company, right? And they're thinking about starting a business. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's no. be um, being, that, is, that is a real dilemma. I mean, not dilemma, but a real opportunity the way I look at it. And that's what I meant early on in terms of uh, what our current areas of um, the research are really focused on. Um, because what happens in a university setting is you get, you, you get students that are wide-eyed, that they are eager, they, they, they have ideas, but yet they have no, uh, or their, their, their skill sets, their competencies, their experiences, are very limited. So we refer to them as embryos. I mean, we work with embryos and we have to understand uh, um, that stage of development. And, um, you know, so when we look at it from an embryonic point of view, I mean, how do they acquire the knowledge, skill sets, and competencies? And as we ask those kinds of questions, uh, it really has a lot of impact on how we teach. So, for example, we'll look at um, we'll look at how um, uh, the impact of mentoring, for example. And we want to. Uh, what I have found, I mean, at our program is that you know you typically in a mentor program you try to go out and you identify. Uh, great people that are in your network, that are, that are in the community, that have accomplished something in their lives, and you try to match them with great students that you think are coachable and can develop. But what we've learned is, you know, and this is part of our research, is that great people that are highly accomplished don't necessarily know how to be effective mentors. And what we've also learned is that uh, even when we get uh, students that we're excited about, bright students, um, they don't know how to be effective mentees. 
And so a big part of this process is how do you bring them together? And, and it does require a lot of background. It requires a lot of training and, and, and nurturing of those kinds of relationships. That's just one example um, of what we look at. So Alex, there's a two part question here, but let me ask the first one here and I'll, and I'll give you an example of it because this really fits in. So currently in my class, in my entrepreneurship class, I am doing a simulation on how to run a cafe, a business, ca a, a business cafe with, 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 a, with a great company, Interpretive Solutions. They're cutting edge, they were at USASB. They have a state of the art simulation. And I'm giving it to my students in my class, right? Mm -hmm. And out of my students, one group, only one group of many is actually making money. The rest are losing money like crazy, okay? Mm -hmm. And so here you are, this is called experiential learning. This is called te teaching them on their feet, telling them, hey, hey, you know, you're really overcharged for the coffee or you're undercharged or you spent too much on paying employees. And we're, 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 exper we're giving them experience on how to do it. But yet in reality, we know in real life, it's even more cutthroat than this. Again, you're calling them embryos. So the question is, are we giving them a disservice or a service by trying to make it less threatening? You know, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Ayman. And uh, that's one that uh, I get very concerned about um, is, you know, one of the things that we tend to do at universities is we try to outdo ourselves in terms of what we can be offering to our students. Um, and I'm talking about incubator facilities. I'm talking about mentoring. I'm talking about getting them legal help. I'm talking about um, uh, putting them in touch with investors and um, um, getting prototypes developed. Um, these are all activities that um, we try to offer our students through a university environment. And, um, but you hit a real important nerve point. Are we creating a codependent relationship so that when a student comes into our environment and we offer them this whole uh, portfolio of different services, um, are we creating a codependency? So I fundamentally ask the question, when they leave us, can they survive in the outside world? When they have to pay rent, when they have to pay a lawyer $600 an hour, um, when they have to pay to get prototypes done and things along those lines. So we, as we expose our students to all of these different kinds of opportunities and the resources that we can provide them as a university and through our incubators and so forth, uh, we really need to be mindful of, are we developing the kinds of skill sets and competencies where they could survive on their own if they're working um, on starting a business soon after leaving college? So Alex, this goes both ways. And um, I, and see, I, I felt bad because I kind of picked on the students here, but it, it goes both ways here. So I'm gonna reverse this. Let's, let's pick on the educators a little bit. So we have right. these educators coming in, no clue about starting a business. They've never done it. They, they got a PhD. They wrote a nice dissertation doing a lot of this high fancy statistics, right? They got published. And we're saying, this is fantastic. You're a superstar in research. Here you go. You have 30 students in an entrepreneurship class. Go teach them. Mm -hmm. What's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> I think it requires a combination. Um, you know, and in, in schools with developed entrepreneurship programs, I think you have to have a real nice mixture of both the 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 academic perspective as well as the practitioner perspective i mean and um, um you know and we really need to blend the two 
um, you know, on, I think it's critical that uh, our, our superstar academics, if they're really focusing on the kind of issues that matter to emerging entrepreneurs, um, uh, we need to develop uh, the kind of um, tools and concepts and, and fundamentally understanding what works and what uh, what needs to really be tweaked and um, uh, that comes from the research perspective um, and effective researchers in entrepreneurship will engage with lots of entrepreneurs and the big concern is you know if you're going to look at bringing people in who've started their company and said because they've started the company they fundamentally understand entrepreneurship. What you need to understand is a lot of times that's coming from an N of one uh, versus the wider perspective that um, um, the academic can bring to the perspective, I mean, to, to the table. So, I mean, it really requires both and it's not, uh, you can't favor one over the other, I think. Oh, and that's, okay. that's my perspective. Okay, so we have Steve uh, mentioned this book, maybe you know about it. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind, showing how our students are becoming more anxious, depressed, and fragile, which ties to a question that came from a colleague from Africa saying, can you just slightly clarify what do you mean by entrepreneurship educator? Which is like a bomb by itself. <laughs> <laughs> right, so so good, good luck. <laughs> Uh, well, that goes back to the fundamental question, I mean, that any of us who have been in the field for a long time, and I mean, uh, and I get asked this a lot at, uh, you know, if I'm at a dinner party or something and somebody comes up to me and says, what do you do? And I say, well, I'm, I'm a professor. I teach entrepreneurship. I always get asked the question, can you really teach someone to be an entrepreneur? Um, and there's a couple of, there's a couple of answers I, I, I give to that question, depending upon my mood at the time. Uh, one, of, one of my answers is, uh, if you ask me, can we really teach someone to be an entrepreneur? Uh, I'd come back to them and say, that's the wrong question to be asking me. The right question to ask is, can entrepreneurs learn? Um, uh, are they open to, to expanding their own skill sets and competencies? So uh, that could lead to a whole discussion on, you know, can you teach entrepreneurship? Um, the other answer that I would give to that question, um, you know, has to deal with fire in the belly. Um, Give me somebody that has the desire, the, the fire in the belly, the, the enthusiasm to do it. And what we can do is we can, we can help, them, um, uh, help them develop their skill sets, their competencies, their professional networks, and we can give them frameworks on how to think about complex entrepreneurial challenges. So I hear a lot, and I even, I'm also as guilty as everybody else. We talk about an entrepreneurial mindset, mm -hmm. okay? You just mentioned it, but you added something where I more agree to, which is the fire inside, okay? In general terms, a lot of people have different meanings about what is a mindset versus the fire in the belly or the fire inside, or if you have it or not have it. Mm -hmm. um, just talk in general, what you mean by mindset, right? And, and, and this fire in the belly thing, because isn't it the same thing? Or is no, it I mean, I think there, is, there are two different aspects, the way I would look at it. Uh, there are two different aspects of it. The, to me, a lot of the entrepreneurial mindset is, is being open to opportunities. You see, I'm in, 
when we go about our business on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, and I, and I teach this in the context, not teach, but I talk about it in the context of signal to noise ratio, for example. Um, you know, we'll go out and, and we are bombarded with data and information and in, in very unorganized ways. And most of us will, will, will just go about our day and, you know, whatever purpose we have and the data and the information that we're being hit with uh, is noise. It just, it just goes right over our head. An entrepreneurial mindset um, is, is, to me, is really developing the sensitivity to tease out the signals from the noise, to, to consciously and proactively look at trends, trend spotting, uh, identifying opportunities, um, and developing ideas based on those opportunities. And to me, that's fundamental to the entrepreneurial mindset. Now, the fire in the belly is something very different. I mean, all of us come up with ideas. All of us, um, uh, at some point in, in, in our journeys, have identified opportunities for business. But why is it that only certain people act on those opportunities? And that's where fire in the belly comes in. That's where self-efficacy comes in, a belief in one's own abilities. Because um, as we learn through a lean startup methodology, it's uh, you're, when you go down an entrepreneurial path, you're laden with assumptions about your business idea and you have very little knowledge. And that's why we ask, we train our students to identify and test assumptions because most of your assumptions are going to be wrong. And how do you react to that? How does a person react? A person with fire in the belly will have the, the interest and the desire to back up and rethink and pivot, if you will, um, to continue moving forward to drive their ideas. So, so that's Alex, where I see a difference. Okay, so Alex, this, this is gonna be a very difficult question now. It's okay. controversial a little bit, but here, that's, it's uncensored here, okay? And I'm, I'm, okay, so be ready, put your shield up or whatever, you need to be ready here. I read in the news um, over the weekend, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, that WeWork stopped paying rent. That WeWork, the, 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 the place, the, the co-share, the co-working space stopped paying rent on all its, most of its locations. It's skipping rent. And I stopped there and I, and I hesitated and I said, that's the end of what somebody just quoted here, the generation me. This fancy schmancy co-working spaces where you have nice places with espresso bars and, and coffee shops and, and, and 24 seven, and, you, and it's subsidized by universities, it's subsidized by many people for them to come and mingle. I think it's an end of this lifestyle of sorts. It's, the world is changing. Now we're in a new normal here. This is gonna change rapidly here. There's no longer this, this kind of please come and this is a co-working space because we want you to feel good so you can generate some good ideas. This is more like the survival of who can adapt the most. <laughs> Mm -hmm. What do you say about this? I think it goes back to fire in the belly, Iman. I mean, the espresso bars and the, and the scenarios around, you know, uh, congregating amongst like-minded people. I mean, my daughter, my daughter Emily works in a, in a WeWork facility in Brooklyn, and it's a fantastic place. You, you can you can feel the energy of the different startups and being amongst like-minded people. So that's, that's fantastic. But if that's provided to you by an outside entity, a WeWork, I'm okay. Um, but if you have to depend upon that to move your business idea forward, um, 
where is the fire in the belly? Um, the fire in the belly is, you know, being able to deal with adversity. And, and um, you know, I mean, you don't need the espresso bar and, uh, uh, and the, the other accoutrements of an incubator facility on a university, if you will. Uh, you don't need those accoutrements if you fundamentally believe in your idea and are willing to pursue it. Now, having WeWork facilities, that's nice. And um, uh, it's a great place to work. But if that's not available, does that end your idea? Or does that end your desire? I hope not. So let let me pivot a little bit here, and and because you, you you come with a unique proposition that you've done this, and I think it's maybe 2016 where you started the, the first I call it, and I think you should, you know, I think you should patent this and, and make it global uh, the learning journeys, and in which you have um, held the USASB conference, but part of the USASB conference you've done something remarkable something that was so innovative and so creative that you've taken attendees at the, USA, at the USASB conference in San Diego and you've put them up on the bus and we crossed the border to Mexico to look at another ecosystem, an entrepreneurial e ecosystem, and we went to their startups, their incubators, we met with their entrepreneurs. So that innovation sparked a lot of conversation, which resulted in you coming to speak at the United Nations, about uh, what are you call barriers to the development of entrepreneurship and innovation in current economies because you brought two sides of the story here is 30 minutes away is san diego and their ecosystem and then we jump to, to, to tijuana and here is the next ecosystem share this with everybody this is a great story to share wow yeah i mean um, i wish i can claim credit for the um uh for the learning journey moniker that or that branding of it but that was developed by my friend ray smiler uh, a couple of usasby conferences before mine uh, when he did it uh when our usasby conference was in fort worth but when we were hosting the usasby conference in san diego we wanted to take it to another level the concept of a learning journey is uh, when any conference, whether it's uh, ICSB or USASB or the California Educators Conference or any conference, uh, when you're in a new location, a big part of it is you've got a lot of conference attendees that are from different areas, different regions. And so we want to expose people to the different regions. And that led us to look at our unique positioning because we are in san diego and we're just 30 miles uh, less than 30 miles uh, uh, from the border with mexico um, uh, i've had some incredibly unique opportunities to um, engage with my colleagues in particular at setis university in mexico um, um, where we could look at the emerging ecosystems um, in entrepreneurship. And in a lot of ways, they're different because of um, access to capital is different on one side of the border versus the other side of the border. Cultural differences um, uh, emerge. But you know what? I have found um, uh, working with Mexican entrepreneurs on, on you know, through my work with SETIS University, uh, to be amazingly driven, amazingly creative because of they see opportunity, they have desire, and, and because of a perceived lack of resources, um, it, it leads to higher levels of creativity, I believe. And so, what I wanted to really show is when we do our live academic conference uh, in San Diego is to introduce our academic colleagues and our, and our, our conference participants to seeing both sides of that border uh, in terms of opportunity. Um, 
you know, so we'll do this with our students. We'll bring our students into Mexico to interact with Mexican students. We'll bring Mexican students on our side because we're trying to promote uh, that, that um, um, cooperation across the borders because that's where uh, big opportunities will lie. I mean, when you can, when you can combine uh, the strength of different cultures. And that's so, what we tried to do with our learning journey to Baja, California. So after COVID-19 and the pandemic, what's, what's your feelings about the world moving forward when, about barriers to entrepreneurship? To Will this all go away and people realize that we are actually truly a global economy? What, what's, your, what's your thinking about this? You know what? I mean, my thinking is just the opposite. Um, I mean, look how look how much we've been able to bring people together. Now I see the 20 some odd people on this particular call right now. And, uh, um, but my guess is that they're coming from different parts of the world. And because of technology, the timing of this is incredible because, um, you know, we are dealing with this tragedy, it's a, and it truly is a tragedy of global proportions. But it's forced us um, to become more interdependent with one another and interconnected with one another through, um, through the miracle of technologies. And we have um, companies like Zoom and, um, uh, other platforms like that that are enabling us to engage in new and very innovative and very different kinds of ways. Um, so, yes, when this crisis is over, we are going to go into a new normal. Uh, we are going to, I mean, um, people are a lot more comfortable now in a very short period of time in interacting with one another through platforms like this. Um, and I think that when we can safely engage with each other face to face, we're going to be using these kinds of technologies and even newer technologies um, a lot more. So I, I want to talk about a little bit about your innovation that you created a while back the California Entrepreneurship Educator Conference, because this ties well with, with what you were thinking initially about entrepreneurship pedagogy and teaching and the future of entrepreneurship and reimagining entrepreneurship with the conference. So talk a little bit about that and then we'll get into the newer version of it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's something very near and dear to my heart. Um, we started out thinking, um, um, we are in San Diego, we are in California, and um, there are, throughout the state of California, there are incredible programs in, that offer entrepreneurship education in the LA area and um, um, in the, um, the San Francisco area and in between and so forth when you think of the different schools. So we started this conference seven years ago. Uh, we called it the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Uh, and we wanted to invite educators from California universities. We wanted to get to know what was happening within our own state. But the first conference we held, um, we had educators and researchers and practitioners attend this conference from around the world and we even had some participants from Europe and uh, Guam that showed up at this first conference and I said well why did you come to this conference because people were started looking at the content of what we were doing so we realized early on that this was bigger than just a California thing and so we were just going to drop California from the name and just call it the Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. But um, um, 
we did some focus groups on it and um, uh, people liked California in the name. Maybe California has cachet or something, but, uh, but this is truly uh, a global conference and this was going to be our seventh year. Uh, we start planning next year's conference the day after uh, we close out the prior year's conference. And it takes a year to really put it together to create great programming um, for conference participants. So what happened this year, Iman, uh, as you know, uh, we were discussing this in Florida with you before time, and we realized we had to cancel the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference after a year's worth of preparation. But this year's theme was called Reimagine. Reimagine Entrepreneurship Education, Reimagine Entrepreneurship Research. And we said, why do we have to cancel? We were watching conferences and other events cancel one right after another. And we said, why do we have to do that? when our theme is reimagined. And frankly, bantering back and forth with you, we came up with a lot of ideas and uh, we pulled our team together, you pulled the team together to partner with us and um, we have reimagined that conference and um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we have over 50 speakers, we have maybe 600 people that have registered for this conference, people want this kind of global engagement. Let me talk a little bit about the topic itself, reimagining entrepreneurship, right? And I'm gonna to move to the next slide here. Um, here, imagine, and I put this word there, uh, and I say, imagine entrepreneurship, Alex. If you were gonna put something in motion, something something you say this is my 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 stake in this whole conversation and what would that be what what would that be where is your heart i'm going to start with your heart first leading towards and then rationalize it with your mind if you may you know what my heart is on this i mean um, um when icsb gave me the opportunity to participate in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise day at the United Nations. Um, and that's when I really got exposed to um, the, the uh, uh, 17 sustainability and development goals of the UN. Those are lofty goals. And, uh, uh, I, and I hadn't been to the United Nations since, since I was a young child growing up and had a class field trip visit. But because of ICSB and uh, what we've done and uh, the work, uh, it has caused me to take a deeper look into it. And that um, really led us to start thinking about the power of our academic community. Um, what do we teach in entrepreneurship? Uh, at its core, beside opportunity, recognition, and analysis, it's, it's problem identification and solution development, problem solution fit, okay? And when I think of the SDGs, the this, this, this Sustainability and Development Goals, it captures my imagination and how can we bring the global intellect of the academic community, the practitioner community, the, the, the policy makers? Um, how do we harness that global intellect uh, to really focus on addressing these, these kinds of goals? The world is demanding it. And I think we as academic entrepreneurship educators are in a great position to uh, be impact players. That captures my imagination and that's why I'm so thrilled that you talked us into pursuing the California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference online. Um, 
because we're bringing together a global community of uh, people that really care. Uh, and for those of you that, that come to this conference, participate with us, pick and choose the sessions you want to go to, but um, we have curated these speakers. I mean, these are, these are people with heart. These are people that truly get it. And um, it's, it's our attempt at bringing that global community together. So, Alex, do you think, and I already asked the participants here to, 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 to give me some words that come to their mind that I will share with you for you to react. But while they're writing some of these words, let me ask you this question here. If we're going to reimagine entrepreneurship, should we then, and this is just an idea here, should we then, and somebody mentioned this earlier about curiosity, should we then force or make it mandatory that every student that's going to take an entrepreneurship class takes an innovation and creativity class before? Say, listen, you know, that's great. You want to do entrepreneurship. You want to start a venture. We're going to teach you about mindset. But before we get into that, let's just start with a class on creativity and innovation. Right? Let's see how you do with this. Because if you think about it, not a lot of business schools offer a course on creativity and innovation. I've done a, a study on this. I think it's dated. Maybe somebody needs a new study there. Out of the top 100 schools in the United States, right, only 10% offer the course with a title in it of innovation and creativity. Hmm. Microfinance, macroeconomics, uh, operational management. But with a course with creativity and innovation in it, offered in a business school, in the top 100 business schools in the United States, there were only 10%. Of, of schools offering with a word in any course title with the word creativity and innovation. Are you surprised? I'm very surprised. I mean, I, I didn't think the numbers were that low. I mean, um, uh, well, I'll put in a plug for San Diego State University. We've had creativity and innovation titled courses for a long time. Um, but I am surprised about that. Um, you know, because I, I, think it's, um, uh, I think it's fundamental, it's a fundamental piece of developing the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, it's, it starts with looking at problems in very different ways, not as barriers, but as, as opportunities. Um, now you suggested requiring uh, schools to have a creativity course before you engage in entrepreneurship. Uh, I think that um, it's a good idea. And if you're guiding somebody from the very beginning of their entrepreneurship academic journey, uh, yeah, I would recommend that they take a creativity course right off the bat. Um, but I wouldn't mandate it uh, coming uh, required at the very beginning because people enter our programs at different stages of development and um, uh, sometimes they don't even discover the creativity course until they're more well immersed in our in our program so uh, yeah. I think it's beneficial at any point in the program because uh, if you're in our program you're even as a senior, an undergraduate senior, you're still an embryo when it comes to entrepreneurship uh, practice. For so the here's, um, here's, some of the, here's some of the attendees saying, when I asked them to give me some words, right? They mentioned the word crazy that comes in and somebody mentioned ethical and then somebody men mentioned endless opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And then somebody said, and somebody said the creativity and innovation should be in primary school. Right, and then we have someone says, and um, they do have a mandatory course in innovation creativity as a prereq for our entrepreneurship program, right? But they, um, it's, it's called instead of called innovation creativity, they call it creativity and innovation, which is what we also call, right? right? But also there's another, but then they have a, they have the entrepreneurship students also are offering a major in creative industries, so that's coming there, okay. and then somebody mentioned. As well, saying um, this is from another colleague saying that they're they're, they're talking about gen generativity that leads to sustainability. 
Generativity, that means creating something, idea, products, startups, etc., taking care of it, and finally let it grow autonomously, but connected with the world. Right? So what would you react to these good comments and suggestions coming from, from our uh, attendees? Um, it shows that our attendees are listening to this discussion and, um, and are engaging and uh, are, are thinking, are, are, are you know, thinking about how they would respond to the questions that you're throwing to me. I'm only offering one perspective, but, um, um, you know, I, uh, I love the diversity of thought that comes into the kinds of questions that, um, or kinds of words that you're asking people to come up with. Uh, if I had the opportunity, I'd react to some of those words. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll invite them to the to the conference here. So earlier on while we were chatting, I was asking you some difficult questions, and I said, "Tell me if I'm mean to you." And I thank God that somebody said nobody said I was mean, but then somebody alerted me saying that people are watching what you're saying here. So I hope I wasn't too mean to you with these difficult questions. I'm in. <laughs> you are always mean to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what leads to our friendship because um, we constantly challenge each other. And as we constantly challenge each other by asking provocative questions, um, we both get better. So, so um, keep so, asking those mean questions. So then, no, I'm done. I'm, I'm done asking. I'm going to ask the people to ask you very difficult or challenging questions now. So if you have a question, that, it, that can, can, can trump my direct questions for him, please write it down so and, I'll, and I'll ask him. So no holds barred, this is uncensored, unfiltered, so ask your question here. Um, but while they're writing the questions here, he goes, somebody mentioned from, from Africa, he goes, I'm imagining that Africa, we move from teaching entrepreneurship to experiential learning. And, and we know Africa is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and actually the future is focusing into Africa. There's a lot of great work done by the ILO in Africa, and we had a presentation earlier about the youth in Africa, right, and the decent jobs for youth. So what's your reaction? But you also mentioned in the webinar, why not just, why just Africa? What about Latin America? So what would you relate to this, about the youth in these, in these up-and-coming regions from the world? I, I think our future depends upon it. Now that's a cliche, but um, uh, the fact that, you know, and I have recently been to Cairo, um, you know, thank you once again to uh, President uh, uh, Ahmed Osman, who hosted the ICSB conference in Cairo. Uh, but what really struck me during my visit there uh, was the emphasis on preparing the next generation of entrepreneurs. Um, uh, I know in, you know, just because of my visit, uh, I know how much emphasis they're placing on it in places like Egypt. Uh, and I would imagine throughout other, other countries in, in Africa. Uh, I see it in my own region, as you mentioned, um, most of a lot of my work is um, uh, is in Mexico with SETIS University, and um, uh, the entrepreneurs that I encounter just because of my proximity to the border here, that's where I can make an impact. But it takes dedicated entrepreneurs and educators and policymakers. Um, uh, and practitioners to nurture and develop through mentoring the next generation of entrepreneurs in your region. I'd say, look at where you could make an impact locally that will have the kind of global um, impact that, that we so need and so desire. And here comes the questions. I told you they're going to come with questions here. So, um, so here's a question. Is entrepreneurship policy a must for the delivery of entrepreneurship education? Well, that, I mean, entrepreneurship policy um, could be a lot of things. I mean, we, 
we advocate for, uh, you do need policies in place uh, to protect intellectual property, to encourage investors to engage with entrepreneurs um, um, and, and to, to create the framework in which entrepreneurs can operate. Now, um, when we talk about policy and entrepreneurship discussions, um, we, we want to see the kind of policies that will promote entrepreneurial activity and such as, um, um, you know, breaking down the barriers that, that stand in front of somebody who wants to create a new company. For example, I'm talking about tax barriers, I'm talking about filings, um, permits, licensing. Now you do need them, but can we do that in ways that facilitate, not inhibit entrepreneurship? So here's a question that, that comes here, and one is a, a, a preference question, so it's more of a, your style than anything else. He goes, do you prefer the business model canvas or, or the lean for designing new ventures? This is more of a pedagogical style of preference that you have. Yes. I, I think uh, both of them are relevant at different, different times. And um, I think you have to tease out an idea first. Um, and, and I think the lean canvas does a better job of that initially uh, to, to, to be a catalyst to get the ball rolling. But then beyond that, I mean, the, uh, I like the canvas because it really starts getting you to not only conceptualize what a business model might look, at, might look like, but to identify and begin to test the assumptions. So I think both are useful in sequence, and I would use the lean canvas first. Question before we wrap it up here is, what do you think will be the new normal after post-COVID-19? What do you think it might be? Give me some words. I think um, some words, okay. Um, uh, I think, um, more online community building. Uh, this has forced us to come together. I'll give you an example. Last night, uh, my family held a family gathering. Um, and I haven't seen, I come from a large Italian family, and I haven't seen half of my relatives for many, many years. But because of this, and because of a platform like Zoom, we all got together and it was incredible. Uh, I think that when we are back in face-to-face -face contact with one another, I think we're gonna take these tools and we're gonna build on them and we're gonna find new ways to engage um, even, even more meaningfully going forward. So, I mean, this is such a tragedy and um, there are people suffering not only physically, but economically. But I think that, or and my hope is that we will all come out of this with new tools, new concepts, new ideas, uh, new ways of interacting with one another. And I hope that this brings us together um, um, more often. So I have the last slide here and, and it says Dr. Alex De Noble and there's a picture of you standing on top of a, either a mountain or- That's or the Grand Canyon. That's the Grand Canyon behind me there. And, and you look very, very elegant. You look very <laughs> powerful like you look, right? So I'm gonna put the slide here. You are in a leadership position. You're leading at your university, with the conference, with the ICSB, right? As a person, what are some of the values you like to share with us? That you say, regardless of what I am in, in, in title and position, here are some of the key values that I, that I strongly, I hold dearly to myself. 
you know, that goes back to identity and um, who you are and how you conduct yourself. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that, um, you know, you've got to uh, prioritize yourself because you have multiple identities. I mean, my identity is, you know, I'm a, I mean, I identify myself professionally as a professor, um, a director, a member of our organizations, uh, but I'm also a father. I'm also a husband. I'm also a friend. I'm also um, someone who is an outdoor enthusiast, um, you know, and I think you have to think holistically about who you are and, and, you know, blend those different aspects. And that, that's what makes each of us unique because we all come from different experiences um, and we bring the best of those. I mean, that's, I'd like to think of it that way at least uh, in terms of how I conduct myself and uh, when I'm in professional forms. So uh, a couple of small questions here just to kind of wrap it up is what's your current hobbies aside from staying at home <laughs> well when i don't have to stay at home and you can see the picture um uh, my wife and family and i love um love outdoors um i i spend a lot of time in arizona the sedona arizona uh in particular that's the grand canyon right behind me there and um uh, uh, but I, I, I just love interacting with nature that way because, and I'll give you an example. Uh, my wife and I took, a, took two hikes this past summer in the Sedona, Arizona region, and we found these petroglyphs, and we found these, um, you, know, you know, just amazing paintings, and, and, uh, and it brought us back to the ancients. Um, and how sophisticated they were. Um, and that's, that's something I gained from activities outside of my professional activity when you, can, when you can see and experience that in timeless kinds of ways. What are you currently reading, aside from trying to plan an online conference for the first time ever with 600 people? <laughs> Well, I have different kinds of genres in my reading. Uh, I like to read books about leaders um, uh, that, that are in very trying times. Um, uh, I've re just finished reading a book called uh, Presidents of War. Uh, and it took, and it started with, in the United States, uh, one of our earlier presidents, James Madison, uh, all the way up to um, uh, George Bush. Um, and we looked at many different, I mean, the book focused on many of these presidents and the immense challenges and crises that they faced and the kinds of decisions that they had to make. I mean, I try to pull out um, uh, tidbits of leadership from that kind of readings. Um, uh, I can recommend Presidents of War. I could recommend The Accidental President, which is about Harry Truman. I could recommend um, um, 1941, which portrays Roosevelt's challenges. And um, uh, I can even go back and recommend a book about Alexander Hamilton, um, you know, and some of the challenges that early U.S. American founders had. And, I like to I like to put myself in their place and try to understand how to manage how to be leaders and how to manage crises. Uh, other readings, uh, I'm a big fan of Mitch Albom. Um, he he's uh, he's done he's famous for Tuesdays with Maury. Um, you know, one of my favorite books is The Magic Strings of Frankie Presto because it it talks about the different groups you're playing in different bands. Um, uh, I learned so much uh, from inspirational books uh, 
uh, like that. And then I've got my professional reading. Um, uh, I just finished uh, Kai Fu Lee's book called AI Superpowers. Um, and it's just a fascinating read that impacts, um, you know, what I'll talk to my students about. Uh, I like to listen to the podcast, especially Guy Raz podcasts on how I built this. And we, we think about how we can share those experiences. So those are some of the things that keep me busy, hobbies and reading and podcasts. Um, Alex, last comments. If you want to leave with last um, sentence or two about um, your, your thinking about the session, but also thinking ahead, what would that be? Well, um, over the last month and a half, uh, and Ayman, you've been a great partner with us. We've been thinking about how do we take this conference online? How do we bring people together um, uh, to continue the discussions, to continue the dialogue? And, um, you know, I mean, uh, there's been so much effort going into it. Uh, and that gets us to Thursday and Friday. And Friday afternoon, uh, the conference will be over. Um, but I hope it's not going to be over. I hope it's the, I hope it's going to be the beginning of even more dialogues, like what you're doing here with this, uh, with this particular chat and the other kinds of ways for people to intelligently engage with one another um, uh, on a continuous basis and not just once a year at an annual conference. So uh, I hope we can build on our community. That's, that's the purpose of what we're doing this coming Thursday, Friday at the uh, California Entrepreneurship Educators Conference. Um, thank you, Alex. This has absolutely been fantastic. We, we tried this something I think is truly remarkable here where it was it was on the spot but we we took in many different directions and a lot of people contributed extremely well so i'm thankful to all the attendees that came and gave us comments and ideas and questions we're, we're really greatly appreciative of this this session will be recorded and will be posted on the icsb tv and hopefully I'll, I'll put an article together and based on the some of the themes that we came out of it as well which are critically important as we move forward so um, on behalf of the ICSB and the ICSB family worldwide, uh, Dr. Alex De Noble, we thank you very much for this uncensored, unfiltered uh, webinar with ICSB. My pleasure, Raymond, yeah. and uh, let's do more. Absolutely. And uh, as we continue for tomorrow, tomorrow at um, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Dr. Debbie Brock will be joining us on ICSB Exchange webinar on social entrepreneurship and the impact it has currently in the world and moving forward. So I look forward to seeing a lot of you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Debbie Brock on social entrepreneurship. With that, I want to thank everybody for coming today, for giving us an hour of your time. Uh, ICSB sends you well wishes. Stay safe and wash your hands. <laughs> thank you. All right.